Hello, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Dr. Helen Hester. I'm Associate Professor of Media and Communication at the University of West London. And I'm going to be talking to you today on the topic of sight beyond sight, alienation, universalism and situated solidarities. So when I was invited to participate in this event, I was given a prompt. Zeno hospitality, Zeno solidarity and technologies of care as key strategies to design new ways of being together. This led me to revisit two of perhaps the most controversial elements of the Zeno feminist manifesto, namely the concepts of alienation and of the intersectional universal and to think about them in the context of debates around situated knowledges. I want to begin my talk today by returning to perhaps the most famous approach to situated knowledge, Donna Haraway's Situated Knowledges, The Science Question in Feminism and the Privilege of Partial Perspective. First developed in 1987, her argument stresses the influence of one's social location upon one's comprehension of the world and argues that feminist approaches to knowledge must tread a path between relativism on the one side and totalization and single vision on the other. We must not seek a view from above, Haraway argues, but rather work toward the joining of partial views into a collective subject position. By weaving together multiple views from somewhere, this account suggests, one can obtain a more faithful account of reality. Haraway describes this process in terms that are particularly relevant to our current discussion, that is as partial, locatable, critical knowledges, sustaining the possibility of webs of connection called solidarity in politics and shared conversations in epistemology. Our perspective depends on our position then. Sight, as in vision and the capacity to envision, is tied to sight, as in our location and social emplacement. There is much to agree with in this account of thought that it begins from a given situation, that it must begin from some location, from some body or entity, is a claim that brooks no disagreement. But Haraway's work has not gone unchallenged. Several feminist critics have pointed to its potentially problematic implications, particularly in terms of the ways in which it has been popularized. Sylvia Wolby, for example, argues that following Haraway, Differences of social location have been taken to mean that we can aspire merely to partial and situated knowledges. That is, a series of incommensurable knowledges or forms of knowledge fundamentally separated from each other. Despite Haraway's claims regarding the webbing and connectedness of knowledges, she is read as arguing for the impossibility of truly appreciating the other's point of view. The upshot of this is that the grounds for feminist solidarity are eroded and the possibilities for struggling productively alongside one another are thought to recede. Now, to be fair to Haraway, the idea that her concept of situated knowledge rejects subjectivity and wants to give up on routine knowledge development through theory and data is a misreading. In whatever way her ideas have been used, Haraway is always at heart a scientist. She writes on behalf of those who would still like to talk about reality and is scathing about postmodern feminism's willingness to reject the notion of truth. Uh, she notes wryly that, quote, we unmasked the doctrines of objectivity because they threatened our embodied accounts of the truth. And we ended up with one more excuse for not learning any post-Newtonian physics and one more reason to drop the old feminist self-help practices of repairing our own cars. Despite some elements of her reputation, then, we can see that Haraway is committed to objectivity, to reason and to a knowable reality. It is, in fact, a misreading of situated knowledge as entrenched knowledge, which generates deleterious political effects. The tensions between Haraway's work and its popularization and critical reception is my starting point today. More generally than this, though, I want to revisit the thorny issue 
of how to recognize, respect and respond to difference and consider how this has been approached in contemporary feminist theories of solidarity. I will start by considering the dismissal of difference and its expression via the idea of situated knowledges as a barrier to political solidarity, uh, particularly within feminism, before looking to alienation and universalism as means of navigating situatedness and solidarity. By doing so, I hope to move toward a more developed understanding of what a specifically feminist approach to solidarity might look like. As has already become apparent, when the differences of perspective implied by the idea of situated knowledge are seen to be static or entrenched, they can be positioned as barriers to solidarity. Jodie Dean makes this point when, in engaging with Haraway's legacy, she declares that she is convinced that a major barrier to women's working together has been our inability to conceive of connecting with each other through and across our differences. Because our differences from each other have been conceptualised as barriers, we have understood relationships as premised on agreement. This has kept us from working together when consensus is not possible. Within such conceptions, one's location is taken as fixed. One cannot change position and, as such, one cannot work for and from the other perspectives. Swati Parasha makes a related point when she suggests that, while the feminist movement typically remains committed to the politics of anti-racism and anti-colonialism and against Western cultural imperialism, any debate about harmful cultural practices in the global South remains unexplored or burdened by concerns about the authentic voice which can engage in the speech act. According to this account, anxieties about speaking to issues that do not directly affect one come to act as blockages to the practice of feminist solidarity. Parasha does not simply dismiss these concerns, and nor does she downplay the fact that they might stem from a desire to respect the autonomous organising efforts of others. Indeed, she notes that in building transnational solidarity, transcending cultural boundaries in the name of women's rights is a very difficult and sensitive area. Ethnic group members of movements for improving human rights know the best approach to organising around these issues. Ultimately, however, she is critical of the ways in which staying in one's lane comes to restrict the possibility for coalitional politics. We should not let others become isolated in their struggles, she argues. Instead, we must build strong intercultural relations and promote open and frank dialogue to address the fear of the unknown and understand difference. As these comments suggest, there is a risk that discourses grounded in reductive understandings of situated knowledge actually allow people to sidestep issues that don't directly concern them. In short, static understandings of situatedness can be used to not only reinforce existing frames of reference, but participate in the perception of their immutability. Rather than enabling a more reflective kind of politics that goes beyond immediate self-interest, this actually serves to let a lot of people uh, within the context of contemporary feminism, uh, particularly white middle class cis women like myself, off the hook in terms of caring about circumstances that do not map conveniently onto their own. Fortunately, the undeniable situatedness of knowledge does not determine in advance the possibilities of understanding. In truth, while, as Haraway reminds us, all thought does indeed originate from somewhere, it isn't necessarily confined to the parochial. There can be no placelessness, no pure outside from which reason is practised, but it is no less reason for that. To explain this, I want to dig into xenofeminist understandings of alienation, particularly drawing on the work of my Laboria Cubonics colleagues, Patricia Reed and Diane Bauer. My argument is that the possibilities of using reason to see beyond our personal circumstances uh, which uh, xenofeminism describes as a manifestation of alienation, means that it is possible, though not at all easy, to escape from a fixed position. According to Reed, although alienation is often taken as a ubiquitous descriptor of life in our technosphere, to avoid the meaninglessness of its seeming semantic self-evidence, we need to ask, what would a non-alienated condition look like? In her account, 
the consequence of a world without alienation would be to bind us to familiar cognitive schemata, since it refuses engagement with the strange, the foreign and the unknown, fixing common sense to the given. Alienation and abstraction form a kinship in this regard, since both pertain to modes of separation and impersonalization. Bauer pursues a similar line of thinking when she argues that as soon as our species could reason beyond its biological needs, it could be positioned as alienated. Reason grants us some, albeit limited, critical distance from the vicissitudes of instinct and affect, which facilitates a certain capacity for self-reflection, indeed, which forms the basis for any potential self-sovereignty. As Martin Hudlin puts it in his account of Marx's species being, we can discover the ideal conditions for other species by studying their natural way of life, but we cannot discover the best way for us to live simply by studying our present or past societies. We are the only animals among the species known to us who do not have a given place in nature. With Alex Williams and Nick Cernick, I would assert that it is only through harnessing our ability to understand ourselves and our world better, our social, technical, economic, psychological world, that we can come to rule ourselves. With this in mind, we can see that partial and contingent alienation from our biology demands to be considered as a productive force. We are alienated beings by virtue of the ability to reason. Productive alienation, stemming from an ability to think beyond local circumstances and raw sensory data, is crucial to any attempt to engage in reformative self-assessment. We must know ourselves to change ourselves. More than this, however, alienation can be seen as key to understanding the full implications of responsibility. So that's uh, response hyphen ability, a term I'm using in Haraway's sense of the capacity to respond, uh, a sort of um, simultaneous obligation and facility to take action. Pete Wolfendale has remarked on the fact that left accelerationist projects, uh, including xenofeminism, share a common commitment not only to knowing ourselves and the world we live in, but to actively using this knowledge to cultivate our agency and engage with the world's problems. Such comments helpfully foreground the connections between reason and responsibility, alienation and agency, and point to one important basis for solidarity building. The issue of solidarity across difference is particularly important here, given that it is largely dependent upon alienation for its successful functioning. Indeed, alienation is a precondition of its very possibility. Without the exercise of self-transcending reason, there can be no taking up of another's struggle. As a species capable of achieving an unsurpassed insight into complex and intersecting global systems, we need to, as Reed puts it, practice care in a manner commensurate with the proportions of complex reality today, which means learning to care for unfamiliar relations and knowing how to care at the scale of the impersonal. Ultimately, this idea of impersonal care for the unknown and the unfamiliar folds into a project for a solidarity without sameness, uh, what we might call xenosolidarity. This has important implications for our discussion of perspective and position within accounts of situated knowledges. Having the ability to engage in complex forms of abstract reasoning brings with it a particular kind of responsibility, one with the ability to reach beyond the immediate realm of the same and into the Zeno. This arguably facilitates uh, attentiveness not only to the needs of other sapient beings, but also to non-sapient forms of life and to the various ecologies that sustain us all. Indeed, ecology is a particularly crucial issue in this context, given its ongoing and rapidly evolving entanglement with alienation. There is no unmediated way to confront global climate change today, for example. As such, a sort of vast infrastructure has been set up to provide us with an understanding of the climate, 
one that is necessarily extra local in its scope. Something like the global average temperature is not information that can be simply or immediately obtained by going to a place and taking a single measurement, uh, let alone using nothing but one's organic sense organs. It requires a huge amount of data from around the world, data that we obtain via satellites, with ships, using all these many and varied apparatuses of a necessarily global technological process. There are a huge number of factors that need to be taken into account with every measurement if we are to understand how the temperature is increasing globally to the best of our current abilities. There is no unalienated process via which things like climatic phenomena can be appreciated. We are reliant both on our collective capacity to think beyond our location, our sight, and on the technical augmentation of limited human perception, our sight, if we are to have any hope of understanding these things. Interestingly, Haraway also develops her account of situated knowledge with reference to technologies that extend the human capacity to envision phenomena. And it is in elaborating this form of cyborg vision that she most forcefully articulates something akin to the idea of sight beyond sight. She points to, quote, photographs of how the world looks to the compound eyes of an insect, or even from the camera eye of a spy satellite, or the digitally transmitted signals of space probe perceived differences near Jupiter that have been transformed into coffee table colour photographs. The eyes made available in modern technological sciences shatter any idea of passive vision. These prosthetic devices show us that all eyes, including our own organic ones, are active perceptual systems building in translations and specific ways of seeing, that is, ways of life. There is no unmediated photograph or passive camera obscura in scientific accounts of bodies and machines. There are only highly specific visual possibilities, each with a wonderfully detailed, active, partial way of organising worlds. All these pictures of the world should not be allegories of infinite mobility and interchangeability, but of elaborate specificity and difference, and the loving care people might take to learn how to see faithfully from another's point of view, even when the other is our own machine." Uh, end quote. There are deep connections between this position and a xenofeminist account of solidarity, I think. Haraway insists that her approach is not about alienating distance, but I beg to differ. In the sense in which xenofeminism approaches the idea of alienation, as the mediated over the immediate, as our capacity to use abstract reasoning to access a world beyond the input of immediate embodied sense data, the representational devices she discusses precisely are technologies of alienation. They allow us to see otherwise, to encounter from our own position that which exceeds our immediate location. This is something they share with the globe-spanning tools of 21st century climate science. Of course, even with the assistance of technologies of sight beyond sight, human societies have struggled to do generalise any project of steno-solidarity. Those with the greatest responsibility have failed to collectively absorb the knowledge that we as a species have been able to obtain with regards to impending climate crisis, and have remained locked in the pettiest and most parochial forms of self-interest. The knowledges of the powerful are all too often not only situated, but obstinate. We can see then that alienation enables processes of care and solidarity beyond the local scale, including care for the in or non-human. Technologies extend our ability to do this and arguably play an increasingly significant role in such processes. As I hope is becoming clear at this point, by understanding alienation as a necessary precondition for processes of careful solidarity building, I am arguing for both the possibility and the necessity of going beyond one's own standpoint, of using reason to think beyond one's personal experiences. One might describe this as an attempt to unsituate knowledge without unsituating the knower. 
to make the rather modest claim that there are empirically observable human and extra human phenomena which constitute the real, which we may, through the exercise of necessarily and avowedly embodied reason, be progressively able to understand and appreciate. I am, furthermore, suggesting that the process of clearing critical space for neglected perspectives and alternative knowledges cannot take place without the operations of a self-transcending reason capable of recognising that which lies beyond the immediate confines of specific situated consciousnesses. Without alienation, there is no solidarity. For many, these kinds of points will seem straightforward or commonsensical, but they, they're nevertheless real political stakes involved. Remember, critiques of Haraway's notion of situated knowledges have argued that the idea of unavoidable emplacement risks becoming a barrier to coalitional feminisms, and the navigation of difference has long been seen as a stumbling block for things like transnational solidarity. While the claim that we are capable of knowing more than we see is still widely accepted, even within the determinedly counterintuitive realm of feminist critical theory, an assertion of the potential validity of our opinions on matters beyond our own lived experiences remains rather more contentious. This is a matter not simply of knowledge or reason, but of perceived authority and legitimacy. Let me point here to the work of Bell Hooks on sisterhood, which I think makes a, a really forceful case for the possibility and necessity of sight beyond sight. Hooks denounces what she calls special interest groups who lead women to believe that only socialist feminists should be concerned about class, that only lesbian feminists should be concerned about the oppression of lesbian and gay men, that only black women or other women of color should be concerned about racism and so on. In Hooks's view, Every woman can stand in political opposition to sexist, racist, heterosexist and classist oppression. Women must learn to accept responsibility for fighting oppressions that may not directly affect us as individuals. Feminist movement, like other radical movements in our society, suffers when individual concerns and priorities are the only reason for participation. When we show our concern for the collective, we strengthen our solidarity. In explicitly referencing every woman here, in calling us all in to the collective political subject implied by the idea of a feminist sisterhood, Hooks's work gestures to a further set of questions pertaining to solidarity. Specifically, it invites us to consider the operations of the political universal. It is with this in mind that I turn to the final part of this lecture, in which I will revisit the idea of the intersectional universal put forward by the Xenofeminist Manifesto. My argument here is that intersectional universality is in fact best understood as a call for situated solidarities. The Manifesto's treatment of the universal has received a fair bit of pushback from some quarters. Previous attempts to articulate a universal have, as Rosie Breadotti reminds us, been hampered by a willful failure to be properly representative. The universal subject is implicitly assumed to be masculine, white, urbanized, speaking a standard language, heterosexually inscribed in a reproductive unit, and a full citizen of a recognized polity. Critics, cognizant of this exclusionary history, fail to see how gestures towards universality can be anything but oppressive, and argue that to emphasize the generic is to ignore the significance of difference, including racial difference. Such positions are understandable, but they largely misconstrue the meaning of the political universal within a xenofeminist framework. The manifesto concentrates on the fact that the universal is not discovered, but collectively constructed. It is not a universal that can be imposed from above, we write, but built from the bottom up, or better, laterally opening new lines of transit across an uneven landscape. This lateral construction happens via the process of deciding who the us in all of us should refer to. Jodie Dean, in her writing on solidarity, 
refers to this process as the discursive constitution of a coalitional we. This we changes over time, varying with and responding to ever-changing needs and circumstances. The xenofeminist challenge is thus not simply to reject universality, but to contest and to re-engineer the universal. What such a political universal demands is collaboration without amalgamation, coalition without subsumption. The construction of a we provisional and capacious enough to hold all who need to be held. From this perspective, it makes sense to say that universality and solidarity are intertwined. In the manifesto, we insist that in order to have any political utility, a non-absolute generic universality must guard against the facile tendency of conflation with bloated, unmarked particulars, namely Eurocentric universalism, whereby the male is mistaken for the sexless, the white for the raceless, the cis for the real, and so on. Our contention is that such a profound reworking of the universal is necessary for any project seeking to strip identity markers of their ability to act as vectors of discrimination and also for the construction of a mass counter-hegemonic political project on a scale commensurate with anti-capitalist ideas. After all, as Nora Sternfeld argues, every particularism that aims for hegemony has to make use of this universalistic horizon for its struggles. The specific example she draws on in her work is the Zapatistas, who, quote, assume the right the very right a racist perspective denies to the indigenous population to adopt a standpoint transcending their own local concerns and their own struggle and to show solidarity with other struggles. The political universal is mobilized and in the process constructed from below here in the name of coalition and the scaling out of resistances. Extra local perspectives rooted in the particular conditions from which they emerge, but shifted to encompass that which goes beyond immediate social location, are fostered in the name of an appropriately expansionary form of solidarity. Thus, while universalism is generally attributed to the majority society, both within its own paternalistic discourses and amongst a large proportion of the critics, it is nevertheless possible to offer another perspective on this, the appropriation of a strategically universal perspective from the marginalized side, a perspective that steps out of the position of the victim and the object, and that takes pride in its capacity to act in solidarity with others. So uh, these are the, the stakes and the potentials of the kind of universalism xenofeminism engages in. How does this relate to intersectionality and how else might we tease out the connections with solidarity and situated knowledges. As many of its key theorists point out, intersectionality is best understood as a method, a process of doing rather than simply a phenomenon, uh, X meeting Y and Z, to be identified. In demanding a sustained sensitivity to the possibility of compound discrimination and privilege, it prompts us to engage in what Kimberly Crenshaw calls asking the other question. That is, the turning of the objects of one's inquiry around in one's mind so as to see, or at least try to see, those dimensions which might otherwise remain obscured. In this sense, intersectionality is itself an example of the possibility of sight beyond sight. It is the reasoning through of an issue in the light of numerous, often overlooked structures of oppression with a view to more fully appreciating its possible implications, including its implications for those who are dissimilar to us. It is with this understanding in mind that Laboria Cubonics declares the universal must be grasped as intersectional. Intersectionality is not the morselation of collectives into a static fuzz of cross-referenced identities, but a political orientation that slices through every particular, refusing the crass pigeonholing of bodies. Intersectionality, in the form of this process of asking the other question, is not a matter of erecting inescapable identity silos 
or of separating entrenched micro identities with politico philosophical firewalls. It is not about insisting on the entrenchment of situated knowledges. Rather, as a careful process of perception, it serves as the underpinnings for the establishment of a more genuinely collective political subject and a less parochial universal. To the extent that it can be considered a knowledge politics, intersectionality centers the interests and perspectives of those subject to compound discrimination, uh, black women, for example, not because these perspectives are somehow less situated and partial, but rather because they are both more widely neglected and more readily recognized as culturally locatable. As Haraway puts it, there is no immediate vision from the standpoints of the subjugated. These standpoints are not innocent positions and should not be fetishized, romanticized, or considered exempt from scrutiny. On the contrary, such positions are preferred because in principle, they are least likely to allow denial of the critical and interpretive core of all knowledge. That is to say, they resist the God trick of unlocatable knowledge claims. Foregrounding such standpoints remains crucial, both because they destabilize the hegemony of seemingly unmarked positions, but also as a corrective to the overrepresentation of these unmarked positions within what counts as knowledge. As Chandra Talpade Mahanti remarks, if we pay attention to and think from the space of some of the most disenfranchised communities of women in the world, we are most likely to envision a just and democratic society capable of treating all its citizens fairly. Conversely, if we begin our analysis from and limit it to the space of privileged communities, our visions of justice are more likely to be exclusionary because privilege nurtures blindness to those without the same privileges. In adding the qualifier intersectional to the concept universal, xenofeminism seeks to stress that the idea of universality being proffered is precisely not one that seeks to obliterate difference, by framing it as a barrier to class unity, for example, or by denying its impact in terms of people's experiences, perspectives and suffering. Rather, it should be seen as a helpful tool for building a collective we around which people can rally. A we which is, within the terms of our struggle, maximally inclusive. As Veronica Gargo notes, by practicing solidarity, that is, by interweaving a multiplicity of particular conflicts, we come to see what constitutes the universal is transformed. Mass politics is redefined based on practices and struggles that have historically been defined as minoritarian. The opposition between the minoritarian and the majoritarian is thus displaced. The minoritarian take up the mass scale as a vector of radicalization within a composition that does not stop expanding. Meaningful political coalition is tied to the necessity of reasoning from and beyond one standpoint, to attempts to see together without claiming to be another, and to the process and possibility of assembling a collective political subject, which is to say the intersectional universal can be understood as a kind of practice of situated solidarity. Conversely, of course, situated solidarities in which we take on the responsibility of thinking both from and beyond our specific social locations and bounded phenomenological conditions to ask the other questions are reliant upon the intersectional universal. We've covered a, a huge amount of ground in this talk, but we still have not gone far enough. I think it's important to conclude with an acknowledgement of the limits of the framework being discussed here. First of all, developing an account of solidarity is only capable of performing certain kinds of work. As Dean remarks, reflective solidarity is not a panacea for the problems facing feminists and others who try to resist oppression. It is a conception of the kind of connections we need to develop, the process through which we need to work in order to build coalitions that can affect the changes necessary to alleviate the inequalities and sufferings burdening some people's lives. 
Maria Lagones also points to the conceptualization of solidarity as a starting point rather than an achievement in itself, one that opens the way for informed affiliation on the basis of shared social desires and identifications, affiliations that have to be forged. As Lagones puts it, we should not seek a form of coalition that arises from a denial of power differentials, but one that arises from within resistances to power at all levels of oppression. This, I think, is one way to foster situated solidarities. This is where we begin. So thank you very much for listening. I look forward to talking about some of these ideas further and figuring out with you if and how you know, these ideas of xenosolidarity, alienation, and the intersectional universal can be made to be tools for different kinds of struggle. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about it in due course. Thank you very much.